is south and east of Conway. Reverses. I go all the way up to Pickles Gap, Cadbury Creek. Don't go quite as far as Bologna. Uh, do pick up all of Mayflower and, and get a little bit of Alma, a little bit of Jacksonville. Uh, all of our districts are 30,000 people, give or take. Uh, some are larger than others, some are more congested than others. Mine's mostly rural area. Steve McGee, I represent District 72 here in Conway, which is everything pretty much east of Donaghy, north to the Beaver Fork, south to Mayflower, and the east side of it actually butts up against Doug's uh, District, District 40. Jason Raper, State Senate, represent District 35, which encompasses uh, all of Conway, Central Faulkner County, and just a little bit of uh, eastern Perry County. Well, Representative David Meeks, I have uh, District 70, uh, which includes UCA, basically everything west 9 east of Hogan, goes down south of Dave Ward Drive, and picks up a little bit of eastern Perry County. I'm his brother, State Representative Stephen Meeks. I represent District 67, uh, which includes uh, it's kind of a horseshoe thing that goes from Bologna uh, north to uh, Greenbrier, Wooster, and then uh, catch uh, a little bit of West Conway, uh, pretty much Hogan down to uh, Prince over towards the river. I'm Senator Eddie Joe Williams. Uh, this is relatively new district for me. Uh, my prior uh, term, I served all of Lona, Prairie County, and part of Arkansas County, and through the redistricting. Now I have uh, about half the north half of Lono County, uh, the eastern half of Faulkner County, or at least over the Bologna area, and about the west half of White County, and the north half of Pulaski County. So uh, it's, uh, it's truly an honor to be here tonight. Thank you. All right, as I said, uh, the format that we have, this is, this is your forum. So the questions are going to preferably come from you. Uh, I think some of them would rather the questions come from you than from me. So, uh, <laughs> you want the first question? <laughs> uh, all, I, all that we ask is that uh, because you do not have microphones in, in, in the audience, please, please speak up. Uh, uh, state your name. Give us your question. If you want to direct it to any particular legislator, that, that's fine. If you would just have a general question for whoever wants to. Uh, to handle it, and if more than one of them want to, to comment on a question, I mean, that, that'll be fine as well. Basically. They want to interject, actually, there's a couple outlying reps right. that have pieces of Faulkner County, which actually have come in here, and actually, Joe would be welcome to come down too. We'd be love for you to be a part of this. But we have two that if you, they're here. This is Representative Joe Farrar, and he can tell us where he's at. But these guys have little pieces of the edges of the county. And then Josh Miller, actually, lives in Cleveland County. And actually, motion both of them, but they're trying to get out of this. They're trying to send <laughs> out of the uh, Senator David Sanders actually is in route, and uh, I do regrets for Senator Missy Irvin had uh, apparently some sort of emergency back home. She was here at UCA at an event earlier today and literally had to turn around and go back. So, uh, just want to make mention if any of you are represented by those people, that's that's what her absence is. So, thank you very much. And maybe if these guys can introduce themselves. <coughs> Uh, yes, State Representative Joe Farrar, uh, District 44, uh, northern third of Lono County, uh, half of White County, and about that much of Faulkner County. I think Mount Vernon is the biggest that I've got in Faulkner County. So, I'm Josh here. I'm Josh Miller from Haber Springs, and uh, we've got, I'm, I represent District 66, which is portions of Cleveland, Van Buren, and uh, Faulkner County. I've got Guy and Enola, Bono, and Damascus. So a lot of the, uh, the metropolitan regions of this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll move on now uh, with the questions. If you have a question, <coughs> raise your hand, and uh, we, we will get started. Yes, sir. Yes, my name is Paul Calvert, for those of you who don't know me. Um, and I'll ask this for anybody who wants to answer it. The new changes to 573-120, which is the gun law in Arkansas, or the weapons law, what is your interpretation? What does it mean? I'll take a shot at it. I'll take a shot at it real quickly. I've asked the Attorney General for an opinion on it. So I think till we get that, I mean, I've asked a dozen people, and uh, whether it's open carry, whether it's not, uh, I think there's an ambiguity. But I do know that the Attorney General has an opinion, looking for an opinion from him, which I've submitted about two weeks ago. 
again, there's different interpretations of the law. Um, for those of you who may not be aware, uh, basically what the law did was it tried to define what a journey is because, you know, there was no definition for it. And so there was trying to get clarification on what a journey meant, basically meaning if you're traveling from one county to the next, then that would be considered a journey. So if you're going from Fargo to Pulaski or if you're doing two or three counties, it's, it's considered a journey there. Uh, the biggest, I guess, controversial part of it is before uh, what the bill uh, basically says that if a police officer pulls you over and you, you have a gun and he can see it, that um, you know, he could potentially charge you with carrying the weapon. Okay. Um, and what the change actually did, actually says is, is that the officer has to prove that you had intent to use it in a crime. And that's where you have the discrepancy at. Um, some folks are saying, no, it's, it really stays the same as it is now. Others say that it allows you basically to do what they call constitutional carry, meaning you can carry it and the only way that you can be charged is if the police officer can prove that you intended to use it some sort of crime. And that's, again, what our uh, Senator Williams said, we're trying to get an Attorney General's opinion on it. And I'm afraid what's going to end up happening because of the way that it was written is that it will be, somebody will uh, get, get charged with a crime underneath it and it will end up being challenged in court and eventually have to be determined by the court or potentially in next session to try to clarify it a little bit. It also deals, I think, you guys can correct me, just with handguns. It has nothing to do with a long gun. It specifically talks about a handgun. Right, the long uh, guns are actually you know, specified. When you, when, you when, you, you know, when, the Constitution, when it's written, obviously a journey meant probably on a horse, uh, going across, you know, I mean, now you're in a vehicle, and uh, just trying to define, I think, the intent was just to define, just to define the word journey. And people have read a lot into that, so... Hopefully the Attorney General will give us an opinion here in the next uh, 30, 45 days. I think we've got about another month, a little less, before it goes into law. So hopefully we'll get an opinion from that. Okay. All right. We have had uh, Senator David Sanders has arrived. Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> Would you like to hear uh, your 30-second bad second weather out there. I'm, I'm sorry, David. Your, your 30-second introduction. There's, I'm David Sanders. I'm from Little Rock. I represent District 15, which is uh, Pulaski, Faulkner, Perry Conway, and Van Buren counties, portions of, of all those counties. And, uh, happy to be here, and uh, we're heading to Morrillton after this for another event. So appreciate you uh, well, doing well, this very much. much. Surprised you let Alan in, but you know, I guess. Bad days. We let Alan in. Good to see you. All right. Uh, another question. Everyone came. Was that a question? I've got one. Sure. Uh, tell me about SGR 7 and how likely do we think it is it's going to be able to uh, pass the ballot test? Well, I think it. Does everyone know what SJR 7 is? Of course not. Let me explain to you what SJR 7 is. One, uh, the, rule, the role of the legislature now in terms of rules and regulations for the, uh, for the executive branches is one of only review. We get to review. I'm chair of the review committee of ALC. We review contracts, but there are rules and regs. There are other committees. That we, what we do is we review um, rules and regs. And basically what happens is that the uh, executive branch can kind of do what it wants to do. We hear a lot nationally about um, administrate, the administration or executive agencies um, legislating through rules and regulations. And uh, Congress, they really can't do anything about it. Well, SJR 7 gives the legislature approval authority over rules and regulations. So if there was a regulation that would come down the pike, be it, you know, run, run the gamut, anything, <laughs> um, and uh, the legislative body would have the opportunity to hear the rule, proposed rule, or the proposed regulations and give the thumbs up or the thumbs down. I will say that we fundamentally change, uh, fundamentally change how, how we do things in Arkansas. Uh, it is going to be on the ballot. It was one of the one of the constitutional amendments that, that came out. Um, I think it's good. I support it. I think it's fantastic. Senator Person Malone, longtime senator from Arkadelphia, <coughs> was one of the key drivers behind this for many, many years, but never, never saw the light of day. And Senator 
Jonathan Dismang uh, brought that back up along with uh, Andrea Lee, representative from, uh, from Pottsville, Dover, Russell area. And it passed. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. Um, and I, I think it would really, it will force the legislature to, to work hard. And a lot of people to work hard. So there it is. Would it be for... Would it be for things going forward, or would it be retroactive to forward. everything that's in place? Okay. And, and it's really to, to simplify it, not that David didn't simplify it, it's just to reju review and reject. You know, we've just reviewed, we've spent literally thousands of hours a year just reviewing and said we don't like it and move on. But now it gives us a vehicle. And that's interesting about this, this was actually a Senate, it was, it was a Senate um, amendment adopted, which is really unusual, but the House chose to use one of the Senate's amendments to bring it forth. So that shows you some interest on both the House and the Senate in uh, for this process. Follow up. How long will y'all have to be in in session or in committee to get all these things reviewed? Well, and those are done throughout. Those are in the interim. We can meet monthly. We do meet in most cases monthly or bi-monthly. So, so it won't substantially uh, You would have to call back in session to review a contract. We do that now. Yes, so it would require it would require different staff. I think it would require different staffing. I think the current configuration of the staff would have to change. And a policy, a, a, a higher level policy expertise that, that perhaps we do not have today. But it wouldn't be in, we wouldn't have to meet in the session right. to review those. There was a bill that a required an attachment of a fiscal cost of compliance and and that would I think shorten the time that you guys have to review these things if I'm correct uh, yes I've got that here actually. I think representative house while he's looking that up there was a, in, in a committee meeting uh, last week they were going over some budgets and, and and decisions made by some of the colleges let me give you an example uh, University of Arkansas time love has a chancellor's residence that's pretty well run down and they were proposing to spend seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars for that residence uh, not being a member of that committee i fed a question to representative andrea lee from russellville and says ask how many square feet well they told us how many square feet it was and it works out about two hundred forty dollars a square foot for this house now anybody that's priced any housing lately know that's a pretty fine home mm -hmm. and in conjunction with that, they were they had a new administrative rule where they were raising the tuition and fees uh, in conjunction with the construction of this residence. Now, there were some road work, some other things that might have mitigated it, but you can't hardly explain that to folks uh, in one or two sentence version. That rule right there, that administrative rule, would probably have been dropped on that point until they got their money together. I read this week in the paper they had destroyed the old residence, so now one's got to be. There's a good example of where legislative review would have been a good idea. Jason, what you're talking about is, is Act 759, which it does require, in terms of rulemaking, it requires financial impact uh, uh, that, that statements for rules and regulations be submitted. So that, you know, I think that's, you know, a lot of times we talk about, you know, the impact of taxes, we talk about the, the impact of different things. We, what we haven't done, I think, a good job of in recent history is looking at the immense burden that we placed on individuals and families and businesses uh, through the regulatory process. So, yeah, that's, that's big and it's just like anything that you have a revenue impact on a, on a tax increase or a tax cut, you know, it's just another bit of information that policymakers can have. Very important, very yeah. good law. That One of the best, I thought. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. Okay, another question. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Thank you guys all for coming out tonight. My question is about the private option. We know that in Arkansas we've got two, two million nine hundred thousand around there, less than three million people in the state. And we'll get done with we have on Medicaid about seven hundred and sixty thousand right now that we have on Medicaid and we're gonna add another two hundred and fifty thousand at least for the private option, if not more. So I'd like you guys to explain to us how in this state we're gonna pay for over a third of us to be on Medicaid. We include the Medicaid we have on Medicaid now and the private option. How I'm down the road, that's my biggest question, how are we gonna be able to pay for that? Well, I think one of the, and, and you're right, Mary, I appreciate that, that question. Um, and first of all, you know, the, what we did with, with the private option was something that hadn't been, hadn't been done before, hadn't been really proposed before. And, 
and that is to not actually grow the Medicaid rolls. I have a, I have a major problem with the function of Medicaid in the state of Arkansas for a long time. It's one of the reasons why we've been worried about eligibility on Medicaid. People who are on Medicaid who shouldn't be. We've done a good job of making sure that the people who deserve the benefits are the ones that are getting them on. I think there's, I wouldn't go outright and just say out and out fraud taking place all over the place, but there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of abuse. We've seen it. It's been identified. And uh, so we took great, uh, great pleasure. I think everybody here voted for all of the all the reforms that we passed to reform the current system, uh, making uh, making providers comply with, with tax law. The number of reforms uh, it's going to reduce reduce Medicaid expenditures in the state of Arkansas. I'm actually not talking about these things, but going to do something about them. Um, in terms of in terms of Medicaid spending, you're very familiar with the way that the financial structure works. Uh, what we've done uh, is operating through an 1115 waiver, very technical language, uh, is devised a way to extend health care coverage uh, to uninsured. And the difference in the population is going to be somewhere around 80, 70, 80, 90 percent. Of course, you know, if we had to take any action, we'd be adding 40,000 people to the Medicaid rolls proper. We would also be shifting a lot of individuals uh, to the federal government through the exchange of those who are 138 percent of federal poverty, and we'd leave a big donut hole there, and then we'd be exacerbating a lot of the problems that we have currently with the system, the structural problems with Medicaid. So what the private option did was it put continuity of coverage from zero all the way to 400 percent of federal poverty and, and put people on one, one type of coverage. And what we're going to do is to eliminate entire populations from the Medicaid role. My friends on the left cringe a little bit, but I mean, we're going to try to eliminate the Our Kids First program. Think about, go back to when it was divine. Don't, don't fret, but lefty friends. But think about it. When, it, when, it was, when, when that was created, it was, it was created under the idea that there are a large number of people whose, uh, whose children couldn't get coverage because the parents weren't covered. Well, that's no longer needed. Uh, and the fact is there are parents that, who are going to be covered. We need not underwrite all of that. Uh, the other thing that we, and, and Doug was there, um, in review committee last week, we went through an enormous number of contracts. If you look at the stated purpose of those contracts, it was to provide for the uninsured, the underinsured, and those who don't have health care. We spend a lot of money right now at the state level, literally state dollars. And I'm not talking dollars that we're getting a 70-30% match on. I'm talking 100% state dollars today. And I told the committee, I said, now, I want you all to be aware of this, that we are, we are fast approaching a time very quickly where these programs are going away because they were, they were contemplated, they were passed at a different time. And there's no need for them. So to the heart of your question in terms of how we are going to begin to pay, obviously you know the financial structure from the federal government and commitments that they've made. Yeah, well, uh, I think everybody can kind of agree that if we all look at Washington with the Johnny's eye. Uh, um, the fact of the matter is we're going to be able to eliminate a significant amount of spending in the state of Arkansas that has been used to, to, be, uh, to cover uh, the health care for a lot of people who are uninsured and underinsured. So a lot of it is, is moving money around. A lot of it is required of, required of uh, of eliminating, eliminating programs and a lot of it is putting people on a path to where if they are receiving benefits, we're not disincentivizing them to work. The more they work, the more they pay. So I think it's... Representative House, did, did you have a comment? Well, to put a finer point, good to see you, Mary. To put a finer point on your numbers, 500,000 folks uninsured, that's correct. 250,000 of those people, give or take, depending on which experts you want to whose numbers you want, are going on insurance through the insurance exchange due to the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Whether we did anything or not, that was going to happen. So that leaves roughly uh, between 200 and 250,000 people that earn between 17% of the federal poverty limit up to 100% of the federal poverty limit. That's the folks that are going on insurance. And if you'll remember last year, the administration were saying put everybody on Medicaid. Uh, 
uh, folks in our party said, no, it will not happen. We will not do it. But the federal government then came back with, uh, well, uh, several people, including Senator Sanders and, and a number of people came forward and said, can we have that Medicaid money and buy insurance with it? The, the biggest unknown that we have now is going to be the cost of the policy. We've got some good news last week, week before. Uh, it, going back just a little bit, it was looking like to put everybody on Medicaid would cost about $9,000 an individual. California has just done something like this, and I think the insurance policy rate came in like $4,800 per person, and that's on an individual basis. So we're looking at substantially less cost than Medicaid. Um, it's, it's a, it was a choice of, it was one of three bad choices. And that's all we had, is one of three bad choices. Do nothing, put everybody on Medicaid, or use that federal money to buy insurance. There were no other options. Uh, it would have been nice if we could just have our money and subsidize our hospitals and subsidize our doctors. No go with the feds. But what was driving this is uh, the hospitals, Baptist Hospital. Last year, lost 138 million dollars in Medicaid Medicare reimbursement. Um, Obamacare reduced their payments, re reduced their Medicaid money by 155 million dollars. They uh, they suffered 100. This is Baptist Hospital, 142 million dollars in uncollectibles. That's from charity and uh, uh, that's from charity and um, bad debts. Their, their net loss was about $62 million in actual out-of-pocket cost. Uh, last year, Saline County, one of the hospitals that I went and checked with and looked at their numbers, they cleared $1 million, more than $1 million last year. They can't continue, really continue to replace their equipment, things okay. like that. Rick, any other comment? Yeah. So that's what's driving this. I don't know where no. we're at this. Joe, you go ahead. I'll okay. Turn you go ahead. Well, I'll answer your question. I'm not a politician. You're going to raise, increase your taxes. It's just pure and simple. You're going, to, you're going to increase your taxes. When it takes the federal government $27 to save us one, and whether it's federal tax or state tax, you're going to pay more taxes. That's basically the bottom line of this. Doug was right. We don't know what the policy costs are. you got to think $10 either way is $3.5 million. What if, you know, what if your policy comes back six hundred? dollars Well, is it cheaper to do Medicaid or is it cheaper to do higher policy? We don't know that. And that's what was my problem with this whole situation. We don't know. We don't know the exact number of people we're going to have to cover. So, right. And, that, and well, that's a concern for, I think, four or five of us on this panel. There's too many unknowns. Thank you. In terms of various, in terms of how no, no, Medicaid reform. reforms, in terms, Mary, I'm going to advocate some, but of course, it's already been articulated, the, the situation. My opinion on this had to come down finally to the reforms that were coupled with it. The other fact is I wish that what we would have gotten is truly what has been given a nod to, which is basically Medicaid block granting, which is an idea that has been, been alive since the 60s. It's a very conservative idea. Basically, what are you doing is you're getting the innovation Medicaid block grants, but we're just not getting all the purse strings. And as far as the money is concerned, my belief always has been that the tax money is, is the money of each of you that are individually sitting in this room. Whether it's federal money or it's state money, it's money that has been paid in that's our money. So all of the money that ever funds the government comes from people like Bob McCormick and, and from uh, Alan Weatherly and Jim Dotson and John Nabholtz and Linda Tyler. That's, that's where the money comes from. And so it's our money. And so for me, what it came down to individually here, and, and I want to thank, take an opportunity since this is Conway and my home district, and I, I just want to say thank you for all of you coming out on such a horrible night. I saw a lot of heads go down when that little beep went off there long ago. Um, it's bad weather, but I want to tell you that for Conway, where it really struck me, because I'm completely, if I were in Congress, if I were in the U.S. Senate, and I think any of these here, there's a lot to be done because we're so deep in debt. However, the situation in Arkansas is that when I look my hospital administration in the face and they tell me that if we do nothing, we're going to lose $6 million here at the hospital, and it's going to hurt, it's going to cost jobs, that's untenable for me. 
Uh, when you sit in front of a business owner and say that something's got to give because of, because of the way this is structured, there's going to be potentially 35 to $38 million in penalties for us. That's where the business owner part of it comes in. It's a bad law, folks. And so what we've had to do is figure out how do we survive under this is we can get Congress to do something. You know, Medicare was opened up several times after it was passed. Medicare was opened up, and they actually went back and they did something to improve Medicare, which now it's a fully accepted program. That needs to be done uh, with, with this law. So in terms of locally, um, the Chamber of Commerce here in Conway uh, voted in resolution to support this. Uh, people that were close advisors to me, people that were going to be affected in many, many different ways. Uh, I finally decided that with the, the waivers that were put in, because here's the key for all of this, if they veer at all from the legislation the way that's been written, it we're back at square one in the state of Arkansas. The other thing is, is that we have the power of the appropriations during the fiscal session. If they veer too far from anything there, you also have the ability to just completely cut off the appropriation the next session. So, Ms. Tyler, do you, do you have a question or comment? If I may, I have a follow-up question to Senator Sanders. You mentioned our kids and our kids first, and that your goal is to get rid of our kids first. And uh, I'd like to understand the timeline for that, and then I'd also like to understand, because uh, I'm concerned about, and I think you are too, the this family glitch that is a part of the uh, Affordable Care Act where employers are not required to provide insurance for uh, families. If, 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 in fact, we got rid of our kids, would we cause a number of children who are today covered to be unco not covered? Yeah, good questions. Uh, one, in the family that you're talking about, is one, really the treatment <coughs> is, is how the Affordable Care Act actually treats individuals. I mean, it doesn't even recognize families anymore. That's right. It looks at individuals. So, for instance, <coughs> I have five children. Uh, I don't get my health care through the state. I have a private job. Um, I'm in a grandfather plan, as most Arkansans are, uh, are in grandfather plans. But if I were to take a new job and do or start a business or something, you know what would happen is I would be treated as an individual, my wife would be treated as an individual, and three of my children would be, then there's a cap of three. So that, that's there. That's one of the things that he's talking about. One, it's got to be changed. I got a list of about 20 things that I think we do need to change. The point, the point about the point about our kids first, and the point about, quite frankly, a lot of the other populations that are on Medicaid. We have a lot of populations who are on Medicaid. And it's not, I mean, we're not just talking about 17% to 100% in terms of the private option. We're actually talking about those from zero to 17%. So, you know, what we're working on now is the guidance to the plans. And, and here's what you're going to be bidding on. And here's what you need to be aware of. Here's the transition to market. Here's what we're going to do in year one. Here's what you have to do in year two in terms of movement of populations. Uh, of, 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 of pockets. That's going to be done through the waiver process. Two is the development of the HSA and the MSA account. I mean, truthfully, truthfully, what happens is this. Uh, people who are aware of cost, who are aware and have some stake in the game, uh, we've seen this in Indiana, we've seen it in other states, uh, you know, what we don't want are, are people to just, you know, treat Quite frankly, like people with private insurance, it's, it's insurance. I just go utilize, 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 utilize. Uh, but we want them to have a stake in the responsibility of taking care of their health care. So you've got the MSA the portion of this. The other great benefit of this, Jason uh, had alluded to this, uh, uh, and I got a little was, you know, one of the key things about the private option, when the flexibility is built in. And, and but it's and not a global, it's, it's, as, as Rayford was saying. It's a section 1115. It's not a, it's it's, not a block grant. It's, 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 it's a comprehensive 1115. <laughs> but 11, it's not a block grant. It's exactly what my dear friend George W. Bush asked for, you know, before President Barack Obama was in the White House. Same thing. I'm wondering, Jay, it's the innovation. Yeah. It's the actual innovation of the block grant. Yeah. So, and the other, the other piece that... that, that keeps coming up that I think is, is sort of misrepresented is that all these people who come on to the private option, the policies are going to have to cover all these RAP benefits. And they're not. Not not going to have to do it. So the Good Friday memo is disregarded? It applies. To what, what we're doing here is you will have the medically... I think the mic's yeah, been dead. I think dead. that mic may have killed oh. Is, oh. Just, 
see if we get in, in line. Does this work at all? No. So what happens, what, what, what will be done here is a screen to determine medically needy, the medically needy population. And one of the, one of the things that we passed in the session which will also require a, a waiver, and it would be a 1915B waiver, will be for intense case management. These are the people, and <coughs> these are the people that, um, that might require more types of treatment. That would be covered through that. In terms of, in terms of you know, the, the, the RAP benefit, and RAP benefits, just for somebody knows, are, are those things that, you know, you may, you'd have to provide to a Medicaid-eligible population. One, we've not covered in Arkansas anybody over 17%, so we don't have anything. What would be true maybe in another state that had covered those individuals is not true here because we've not covered them. So, like, trans for instance, transportation, that's one that I was very, very concerned about. Medicaid rule is pretty simple. If you have access to a car, if you have a car, you're not eligible for Medicaid transportation. So I know that, I mean, don't make more of this than what it is, and you know. Well, the wraparound costs, I'm concerned, Medicaid copay for a visit of a doctor is four bucks. Let's say a private insurance wants to pay 15. Where's that 11 gap that Medicaid Yeah, so the other, the, other, the other piece of course, this is what's so crucially, crucial to point out that what we're doing is doing an 1115 waiver. As we, in that guidance that we've given to the plans, we're going to have them develop the cost sharing, give them the freedom to develop the cost sharing plans uh, for folks, for instance, you know, for an ER visit, all those things that you, you know, people maybe not to. For, I took my boy to the ER the other day, he broke his collarbone, I paid my $50 copay there. It was so funny, they were so reluctant to ask for us. I'm here, please, really, I want to pay. It's like, hopefully, hopefully you ask everybody to pay. Um, they will have the flexibility to build those. That's part of the 1115 waiver. We're waiving those rules having the ability to do that, have, give them the ability to be flexible. And, and the fact is, um, e even right now, the old Medicaid, the Medicaid rules, they're, they're revamping those regs in terms of copays right now. The final rules have to be issued. So what we're going to do is have the freedom and the flexibility to develop those, give the policies the ability to develop those those uh, those copays. So again, so, I'm just yeah, good. We're just disregarding the Good Friday memo. No, Jason. As I've basically said for about two months, the Good Friday memo, the purpose of the Good Friday memo was in a large part to dissuade a lot of other states from doing what we're doing. But the Good Friday memo speaks very clearly to those places where they've had Medicaid in place and rules in place in some states throw in a ton of RAP benefits beyond the federal requirements. What we're doing is limiting those. That's going to be, you've got a medically needy population, you need intense case management, a, a 1915B waiver. You're going to, you're going to, and we haven't even talked about all the reforms that we're going to be pursuing in terms of utilization, taking Tom Emmerich's work at Walmart, you probably read about it in the National Journal yesterday, and taking, taking some of the reforms that are happening in real time on private pay self-insured plans today and literally putting those in practice. It's never been done in, in, by government in, this, in the history of this country, but we're going to do it. And, and driving down utilization, bending the cost curve down. So, no, I mean, that's, I think we've been very clear, uh, you know, how this works. And, and read the guidance that we're giving, that we're giving the plans in year two, where you will be prepared to develop your, your cost sharing uh, for the, the 50% to 100% of federal poverty. I mean, be creative. But Senator Sanders, that, addressing the second part of, of Ms. Tyler's question, the timeline, does it depend then on if Congress addresses some of these 20 questions when it relates to our kids first, or will the, no. will see the legislature going forward with that regard? No, we will, we, will, we, will draft, we will draft, we will begin the process of drafting the waivers to transition those populations. And, 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 and in terms of in terms of what Congress may or may not do as, as it looks at us, and that, that remains to be seen. Okay. Ms. Grote. Yes. Thank you all for, for coming here tonight. Um, this is a question for Representative Leeds, for Representative Paul Carr, for Representative Miller. But um, in three years when the money is, has run out, so to speak, what, how, how are we going to pay for it? How are you going to pay for it? I hope I'll be glad to answer that question. And number one, I just want to make a clarification point. When they say everybody voted, it was for the Medicaid reforms. 
like the IG and everything of that nature, there are differences of opinion on the private option. Not all of us actually voted yes on the private option. I'm not going to speak uh, for, again, who voted yes and who voted no. I'll let them do that if they wish to. But my concern with the private option and the reason why I voted no was because I wanted more time to be able to study the plan and get more information and get greater details. I didn't want to make assumptions. I, I didn't want to, um, you know, basically, I, I didn't want to pass the bill and then find out what was in it later on. And so there was a lot of information that we did not know at the time that the vote was taken. And I know that a lot of folks said we had A, B, and C, and that was it. Well, that was because the governor had said we're not going to call a special session. And I was one of the ones that pushed for more time to be able to get more answers, to be able to potentially make the private option better or come up with a better plan. I felt you have a $6 billion program. We should, you know, if we needed to, take maybe a month or two more and then come back for only a day or two at minimal cost to the taxpayer, especially if we can save the, the taxpayer's money or come up with a better plan in order to do it. But to your question, the cost, that definitely is a concern. You know, I'm not looking, wasn't just looking at the first three years, because we know that by adding all those people, you are going to add some to the $16 trillion debt, that our, almost $17 trillion debt now that our federal government is actually in. So for the short term, you know, we, we definitely have to look at the cost, and then are we going to be stuck three years down the road with 10% or possibly more if Congress decided to change uh, the, 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 the match rate, which Paul Ryan has recently come out and said, guess what, that's going to be part of the debt ceiling negotiations. So we may actually trigger something here pretty quick within the next few months if that, in fact, does actually happen. Then it goes away. Then it goes away. That's right. But we as legislators will still have to work on what do we do with those who are unsure? Even if the private option does get implemented, and I, again, I'm not going to try to speak for everybody, but I'm going to continue to work on reforming the current Medicaid system. I'm going to continue to look at ways that we can do better. One of the things down in Florida that I've been very impressed with, um, uh, the, the House Speaker down there, Will Weatherford, has come out and said, look, why don't we offer catastrophic plans? instead of having all these extra benefits. There was a study in Oregon that came out that said that basically you had folks that were on Medicaid and folks that were not on Medicaid because Oregon didn't have the funding to cover them. And they came up and said, there's really no big differences in health outcomes when you look at the group as a whole. They said the difference that you actually see is in the amount of bankruptcies. Because that those that don't have insurance, of course, if you have some big medical condition, they have to go and they have to declare bankruptcy. But for the other things, diabetes and some of your other things, what ends up happening is, is they do get the medical coverage that they need through other means. Or they, they are able to um, go to emergency room or whatever the case may be. And actually find a way to pay for it either through you know, other folks giving them money or through some charitable organization. You know, we have faith-based clinics right here in Arkansas that charge very little. We have, uh, you know, we have a, a dental clinic, and I, and I realize that they do take Medicaid, but they also have some private sources to help offset some of that, that funding. So there are other solutions out there to get people the health care that we need, and we have to continue to work toward that. And, I, and again, I'm not going to speak for everybody else here, but I am going to continue to push for health care reform here in Arkansas because our goal is the same. I think Democrats, Republicans both. We want everybody to have access to health care. We don't want to have hospitals that have uncompensated costs, but the question is, what is the, what is the solution? Do we provide more government solution and put more people on the government goal, which leads us down to a path of more debt for our children and grandchildren that we're passing out? Or do we try to find free market solutions to where we try to get the community more involved through faith-based initiatives and through other initiatives to where the government is not, where people are not so dependent on government for their particular health care. Hey, Representative Fraud, did you want to address this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think Josh did. Um, I want to be pretty simple with it. You, you solve that problem by either you cut reimbursement to the hospitals or the physicians, which we don't know what that is right now. Uh, 
uh, right now, every Medicaid patient comes through. I work for a hospital. We lose money on every Medicaid patient that comes to the district. In my opinion, we, work, we lose money to that. We don't know if the private option is going to be more or less than Medicaid. Well, if it pays less, then we're going to lose even more money. So, and if you cut reimbursement more, you lose it more money. You raise taxes, increase money, or the insurance company. And if it's your job, Well, I, don't know. I want to start with saying that uh, these guys, Senator Sanders and Ray Burton, all the guys down here, they are incredibly smart guys and they have my uh, utmost respect. Uh, although I did not agree uh, with the private option, I know that they worked hard on it. There's, I agree with uh, a lot of it, except for uh, the part about the expansion. And uh, the, the, the biggest part is, you just like your question, is how are we going to pay for it? Uh, with with all these unknowns, I, I have, uh, I didn't run uh, on, on my campaign promises or whatever uh, to say I'm going to go down there to Little Rock and uh, proverbially kick the can down the road for another three years uh, to another legislative body or, or, or whatever to uh, to have to deal with. Uh, we all want the same thing. Y'all tell by looking at me, I care deeply about health care. Uh, I don't want to keep anybody from health care, but I want us to be able to afford it. I don't want it to break our country. I don't want to break our state. And and right now, with, with these unknowns, uh, those are the reasons why I voted no. Uh, there are there's a lot of good things uh, in in this bill other than the exchange and, and Joe's arms giving out some shutting up. Now. Ms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to change subjects. Finish your. Well, I thought we might talk about something. Else. Well, yeah, because I, I think when Acting Senator Rayford asked me to, to do this, I said, well, I can throw out a Medicaid question, then we can turn it into a Medicaid town hall. Well, I might be able to help, Mr. Keith. I think the biggest thing in order to help cut costs is we've got to create jobs, and I think the legislature took a good step. It's not as much as we wanted to, but we did take a good step in the fact that we did cut taxes and some other things to help us. So, right, that's where I'll change the subject. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the out now. David, I can tell you what's going to happen yourself for here, but I won't. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about infrastructure, uh, which is a big problem for every state agency, not whether they're a smaller one in the big scheme of things like AEDN or Highway Department or something. We went to Memphis last weekend. It's pretty obvious that we have some huge infrastructure problems in this state, and I wanted somebody, hopefully several of you, to address uh, what is a problem nationwide, not just people. I, I want to take, take, actually, we took some action on that. I sponsored a, a oh, bill. One second, Senator. Did everyone hear his question? I'm sorry. That, like that he was asking? Okay. He, 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 he asked, uh, I think the gist of it was, what are we doing about infrastructure uh, in our state, which is a, it's a big problem. Actually, there's many of us that are trying to do so. In fact, all of us are here. You know, I think at this table, this was pretty much probably unanimous. We believe that we need to do more to make Arkansas more attractive to industry that wants to relocate here. And also, how do we uh, improve our infrastructure? Uh, we created an intermodal transportation task force, actually, which uh, has appointees from uh, the governor, the legislature, and they are now making those appointments. And, and that segues, actually, Dr. Bradley is here, segues perfectly uh, with the consideration just pursuing what might we do if we could get a regional intermodal transportation authority approved for our area. Uh, currently, uh, we have David Meeks and, and others here locally have been working on this. Uh, we actually have uh, the, I guess you would say, the verbal approval of consent to move forward from our county judges. Uh, Judge Preston Scroggin was very, very supportive of this idea. And what it amounts to, many people say, what is an intermodal transportation authority? We have the Arkansas River that passes right here through Fal by Falker County, Perry County, and Conway County. There's over $3 billion a year that passes through the Toad Suck Lock and Dam, never stopping at all here in Falker County. We have a wonderful I-40 road system. We have an exchange. I don't know if they're going to name it the Senator Baker Exchange or the Robbie Wills Exchange. These two gentlemen are here. Uh, it's what's oh, against law to name it after people now. Is that what you said? <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, there you go. But, but we, we do, so don't die on us. We don't want to name it after you yet. So um, that exchange is going to bring that back to West Conway. We have the airport that's there. Uh, there's a lot of people in this room that are supportive of the airport. 
uh, those are opportunities. And you have road, rail, river, uh, and air. And this has opportunities. There are companies that have looked at Faulkner County and Conway before that did not choose us because they didn't have all of those capabilities. And so uh, there are many options. There are many different projects that can apply. And what that amounts to is that uh, the county judge of Faulkner County, Perry County, and Conway County have agreed uh, under legislation that was passed back in the late 90s that if we form a regional intermodal transportation authority, it gives us that power of that regional group. Uh, and I want to, I don't know if uh, some of the board members of the Chamber of Commerce are probably here tonight, but I want to call the Conway Chamber. They've reached out to the Moralton Chamber. They've already started a lot of interaction and cooperating so that we might get the projects that we wouldn't normally get on our own. And so we're looking at how that we could help. I, I will give a nod. By the way, Jay Smotley is an intern for Tim Griffin, uh, Congressman Griffin's office, Senator Pryor's office, Senator Bozeman's office. They all have been very, very active uh, with us on this idea. And Dr. Don Bradley is, is chairing that effort right now that includes leaders from all over the community. So we're looking hard at that. On the nod for the taxes, which is what are important for our business climate, we passed a multitude of tax cuts that dealt directly with businesses in our state. You had capital gains tax reduction. You had tax reductions as it relates to the cost of uh, fuel. Uh, also with uh, electricity, uh, dealing with uh, specific industries. We also had the sales tax reduction. That was a promise that I made when I, I ran in 2010. I feel like that fundamentally, when you have the third highest poverty rate of children in America, right here in our state, I just think it's immoral uh, to tax their food. We're one of the few states that do that. And uh, that's one thing that I thought people want, is for us to work across the aisle. So Governor Beebe had made the promise, and he allowed me to carry the bill. I think it got him in more trouble than it did me, so that I could carry that bill. We, we got that passed, and it's set on triggers, by the way, after if the DSA case funding goes away, if we pay off bond indebtedness, then the last remaining uh, sales tax on groceries is completely gone. I can tell you that with a $300 million surplus that now we know is going to be even greater, as I told the governor, I think we can get rid of it now. We could have. 40 or 45 million, but that's part of you give and take. You agree so that we don't do anything that would, would be harmful. And, uh, and so, as it relates to infrastructure, the, the people of the state of Arkansas actually passed a the tax. They voted on that to pass a tax to help with the infrastructure. You show me any place that doesn't have roads, and you'll show I'll show you a place that doesn't have anything going on. There's no growth that's there. So, it's important that we have that infrastructure. Senator Rayford, do you have land? In, yeah. in Perry County and Faulkner County that will benefit from the intermodal authority? You know, that's a great question because I heard it said that uh, fact, Senator we, Sanders and I were putting in a port near Maumel. So uh, it would be interesting to know who brought that particular <laughs> river up. But I actually, I actually have land on the Arkansas River, but it is in no way suitable for any kind of uh, a commercial port. Activity. And neither do I. <laughs> but uh, but actually, actually, there is actually zoning, believe it or not, uh, in that particular area. You can't have a swine operation where I live over there in that area. So there's actually zoning. It's not, it's not fit. So, yeah, stay away from the swine. Yeah, right. but go ahead. And let me add to that on the infrastructure uh, question. We, we now are, are closing in on a $5 billion budget that we're going to be spending every year. And it's my belief that what we need to do is we need to look deeply at that budget because I believe that we should be able to come up with at least – one percent, because I believe infrastructure is that important. I believe we can come up at least one percent, which would be fifty million dollars a year, five hundred million dollars more over ten years, that we should be able to put from the general revenue over to the infrastructure. Um, you know, right now, like your 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 uh, sales tax on your tires, your batteries, and that goes into the general revenue, and you really don't get to use it for roads. I think we ought to be able to pull some of that out, and I think we can do that without affecting our education budget, Medicaid budget, and everything else. I think it's just a matter of us looking deeper at our budget and prioritizing it um, and being able to at least use 1%, which would be $50 million a year, in order to do our roads. We'll be able to attract more business, which will then bring in really more revenue to replace that, which we've taken out. I'm going to jump in again and interject on that. One of the greatest things that we can do in Arkansas, and, and, and again, this has had bipartisan support, is convert our school bus fleets, our municipal fleets, our county fleets, to run on alternative fuel. 
you can still purchase uh, CNG for vehicles at a dollar fifty gallon equivalent. Uh, LNG now is, is being utilized. Oklahoma, folks next door to us, has one hundred and eighty CNG filling stations in that state. And I have people ask me all the time, when are we going to have the capability? Conway is about to get, uh, Representative Linda Tyler uh, was actually, we were joined in efforts on that. I actually directed money that went to a program that helped to get a filling station there. And actually, Satterfields applied for the grant, was awarded the grant, and they're about to get that thing put in. Folks, we know that to be independent, we need to use Arkansas Energy to Power Arkansas, and American Energy to Power America. And now, through hydraulic fracturing, which was a topic at Boy State today, by the way, we realize that we can harvest this energy, and they say it's projected in the next decade or so that we're going to be pre producing excuse me, more oil and natural gas than even Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's important for us to do that, and what's happening is Arkansas is not running after this right now, and there's an opportunity. One of the great potential projects for us in this community is the conversion of natural gas to LNG, liquefied natural gas. Uh, Shell Oil has actually said they might be interested in that if, if we can pursue that project. And so what I always would like to see is there be more emphasis and actually what used to be the Shell Caucus, I chair of the Arkansas Oil and Natural Gas Caucus, we now have 37 legislators uh, that are joined together. And I don't know anybody here that's against that. And what happens is you would save so much in tax money you would find that 1% very easy in the fuel savings that you get from that. So David has a great point. And we did try to, to move all the taxes from the batteries and the tires, move that to the roads, and, and Representative Barnett, I think, was carrying that. We couldn't get it done. All right. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jacqueline Martin, and uh, I have a question. Um, Yes, ma'am. I talked to Congressman uh, Crawford's office. I talked to Congressman Griffin's office. I talked to Congressman Griffin himself. I talked to both of our senatorial staff people, and uh, we, I addressed that question. Is there any chance y'all are going to be able to get this thing repealed? They said as long as the, well, they're Republicans, as long as the Democrats control the Senate, no, ma'am, it was not going to be repealed. It's still the law of the How many of y'all are Republicans? So, yes, ma'am. Uh, they don't have the horsepower. And they, that, was, that was the next question I asked. They don't have the horsepower to, to repeal it yet. Well, did they not tell you to vote against the code? You know? No. No. Yeah, they did because I worked very closely with Rick Crawford during the debate. I, tell you, I talked to Rick Crawford. I actually talked to Rick Crawford. Um, at length, and one of the things that he talked about was, you know, I, I went to I went to Speaker Boehner, and when we were having the CR debate, that's the continuing resolution debate, and what what I tried to get, what I tried to get uh, the speaker to do was in that CR debate to hold up the funding for exchanges. Well, I never heard Rick ever mention a word about. It. I said, Rick, where were you, man? Why weren't you on Fox News? Why were why weren't you out there? And, and this is the Republican Speaker of the House. Why didn't you do it? Didn't, I didn't hear any other groups raise this idea or anything. And that really would have actually delayed. It would have delayed. Uh, they could have actually delayed uh, the implementation uh, for a year. But but he's like, well, you know, it was an idea that we that we, that I, I talked about, and, but I couldn't get anybody to go along with it. So I did. I talked to a lot of those a lot of those guys. Uh, Fact is, you know, the uh, the truth is, we 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 were talking about dealing with this for a long time, um, and uh, you know, they contacted us, kind of wanting to know what was you know what what, what was going on, and you know, Rick, had, I got out there and said some things, you know, negative about saying don't do this. He was really the only one that said that, 
Uh, we talked to Cotton, we talked to Griffin, we talked to others. Uh, but, you know, hey. They all forced it. Stephen no, they didn't. No, they actually didn't. They actually didn't say that. They didn't say that. Stephen Meeks. Hey, we'll, we'll switch gears over to your Common uh, Core question. When uh, when Common Core first came into the state, for those of you that don't know what Common Core is, it's a new set of standards that's come in. It's trying to make uh, what we learn in algebra here in Arkansas the same as what a kid would learn in algebra in California and whoever, whatever else states um, is one of the premises behind it. And when it came in, um, didn't get a whole lot of legislative oversight. Uh, that was more of a decision of the executive branch. Um, but it's kind of in their purview. They sent us some information. Hey, this is a great thing. This is what's coming. Um, we're also getting federal dollars uh, because we're going to Common Core. Um, now, uh, I know myself and some of us are starting to take a little bit closer look at it. And uh, I know there are several states that are starting to back out of Common Core because of some of the things that it contains. Um, some of the, well, so you have to be careful. Some of the things Common Core is being blamed on is are things that Common Core allows, but it's not specifically Common Core. I understand, I understand what you're saying, um, what, what you're saying there, but understand some of that is flexibility built in Common Core that people are taking advantage of. Now, there's some reality to some of those things. So um, I've talked to uh, Senator Johnny Key. He's uh, the chairman of uh, the Education Committee over in the Senate. Beginning in July, we're going to start having hearings on Common Core to decide from a legislative point of view whether this is something that we need to do as a state or not. Will that um, be published for the public to attend those hearings? Yeah, if a public can attend any hearing that we hold, just go to the, you know, just do a Google Arkansas General Assembly. Our calendar's on there and all of our meetings are pretty much open to the public. Um, I've heard from one or two constituents that are also sharing a lot of concerns. I've actually reached out to uh, education professionals at the University of Arkansas who study education policy and they have expressed some concerns to me about Common Core. As a matter of fact, one of them has actually pulled his child out of school because of Common Core. Um, so, you know, I think it's something that we're going to have to scrutinize uh, more so than has been done uh, up to this point. Have you attended the State Board Education Board meetings? Before? I have not, no. Would you please attend those? Because there are some people, and I understand the governor appoints most of them, on this board that express themselves very freely. Mm -hmm. And in one in particular, if you want to know her name, I'll tell you later, but she calls those districts in, in Arkansas who don't want to implement Common Core resistors. Mm -hmm. And I have a problem with appointing government officials, not elected, mm -hmm. labeling citizens in this state. And I would like for you to look into that because now they're starting a marketing thing for Common Core. Okay. And good. why the state board needs to be elected. Do we have other comments from the from the legislators on Common Core. All right, well, we have been here an hour, and we said that was our time limit. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Senator uh, Rayford. To Just to wrap it yes, up. I, I wanted to especially people to think about the representation of all the, the legislators that are here. Uh, with the changes in the population growth in Faulkner County, you went from uh, just, I guess it was three, four legislators, I believe it was the total amount, was that about right? Now you actually have four senators that represent, used to be only Gilbert Baker, so you have four uh, senators that represent Faulkner County. You have six individual representatives. In addition to that, we represent everybody except for Jim Dotson. Representative Jim Dotson has come, and he's a good man from Northwest Arkansas, say hello to him. But I do want to say thank you for coming. Uh, it's important, and, and, and I, I want to say this. Boy, in Boy State today, they asked a really big question, those of you that were there, about what was the toughest part of this job. And, and, and that was a good question, and, and I'll tell you what really came through, and, and I can tell you that because uh, I'm not the only person that, that has endured some really tough things that's come out of service. We serve because we care, and I really respect vigorous debate on the issues. But when it gets to the point that the state police has to tell your family to leave the state, that you're threatened, that's when we've lost our civility. It really is. And I want to applaud every single one of you that even had different opinions here tonight and you, you maintained your civility with each other. Because we're actually in a critical point in time in our country right now where that is precious and is about to be lost in many areas. 
And so I just want to commend you for what you're doing because at the end of the day, we're all Arkansans, we're all Americans, and we're trying to do the very best that we can. And we, we're all in this boat together. And uh, when you travel internationally and you see things that are going on around the world, you come back here. I love the Republicans and the Democrats and the Greens and the Independents and everybody that's here because we do have some American values that we do share. So I just wanted to say thank you and give David and Keith a good hand for driving all the way from Mississippi. So thank you very much.